Preface to The One Hoss Shay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The One Hoss Shay, with its companion poems, How the Old Horse Won the Bet, and The Broomstick Train, by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Preface. My publisher suggested the bringing together of the three poems here presented to the reader as being to some extent alike in their general character. The wonderful one-hoss shay is a perfectly intelligible conception, whatever material difficulties it presents. It is conceivable that a being of an order superior to humanity should so understand the conditions of matter that he could construct a machine which should go to pieces, if not into its constituent atoms, at a given moment of the future. The mind may take a certain pleasure in this picture of the impossible. The event follows as a logical consequence of the presupposed condition of things. There is a practical lesson to be got out of the story. Observation shows us in what point any particular mechanism is most likely to give way. In a wagon, for instance, the weak point is where the axle enters the hub or nave. When the wagon breaks down, three times out of four, I think, it is at this point that the accident occurs. The workman should see to it that this part should never give way, then find the next vulnerable place, and so on, until he arrives logically at the perfect result attained by the deacon. Unquestionably, there is something a little like extravagance in How the Old Horse Won the Bet, which taxes the credulity of experienced horsemen. Still, there have been a good many surprises in the history of the turf and the trotting course. The Godolphin Arabian was taken from ignoble drudgery to become the patriarch of the English racing stock. Old Dutchman was transferred from between the shafts of a cart to become a champion of the American trotters in his time. Old Blue, a famous Boston horse of the early decades of this century, was said to trot a mile in less than three minutes, but I do not find any exact record of his achievements. Those who have followed the history of the American trotting horse are aware of the wonderful development of speed attained in these last years. The lowest time, as yet recorded, is by Maud S. in two minutes, eight and three-fourths seconds. If there are any anachronisms or other inaccuracies in this story, the reader will please to remember that the narrator's memory is liable to be at fault, and if the event recorded interests him, will not worry over any little slips or stumbles. The terrible witchcraft drama of 1692 has been seriously treated, as it well deserves to be. The story has been told in two large volumes by the Reverend Charles Wentworth Upham, and in a small and more succinct volume, based upon his work, by his daughter-in-law, Carolyn E. Upham. The delusion commonly spoken of as if it belonged to Salem was more widely diffused through the towns of Essex County. Looking upon it as a pitiful and long-dead and buried superstition, I trust my poem will no more offend the good people of Essex County than Tam O'Shanter worries the honest folk of Ayrshire. The localities referred to are those with which I am familiar in my drives about Essex County. O. W. H. July 1891 End of the Preface Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden The Deacon's Masterpiece, or The Wonderful one Hoss Shay, A Logical Story, by Oliver Wendell Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Have you heard of the wonderful one Hoss Shay that was built in such a logical way? It ran a hundred years to a day, and then of a sudden it... Ah, but stay, I'll tell you what happened without delay. Scaring the parson into fits, frightening people out of their wits. Have you ever heard of that, I say? Seventeen hundred and fifty-five, Georgius Secundus was then alive, snuffy old drone from the German hive. That was the year when Lisbon town saw the earth open and gulp her down, and Braddock's army was done so brown, left without a scalp to its crown. It was on the terrible earthquake day that the deacon finished the one hoss shay. Now in building of chases, I tell you what, there is always somewhere a weakest spot in hub, tire, fellow, in spring or thill, in panel or crossbar, or floor or sill, in screw, bolt, thoroughbrace, lurking still, find it somewhere you must and will, above or below, or within or without, and that's the reason, beyond a doubt, a chase breaks down, but doesn't wear out. But the deacon swore, as deacons do, with an adieu vum, or an I tell you, he would build one shay to beat the town and the county and all the country round. 
it should be so built that it couldn't break down. Fur, said the deacon, tis mighty plain that the weakest place must stand the strain, and the way to fix it, as I maintain, is only just to make that place as strong as the rest. So the deacon inquired of the village folk where he could find the strongest oak that couldn't be split, nor bent, nor broke. That was for spokes and floor and sills. He sent for lancewood to make the thills. The crossbars were ash from the straightest trees. The panels of white wood that cuts like cheese, but lasts like iron for things like these. The hubs of logs from the settler's alum, last of its timber, they couldn't sell em. Never an axe had seen their chips, and the wedges flew from between their lip, their blunt ends fizzled like celery tips. Step and prop iron, bolt and screw, spring, tire, axle, and linchpin, too. Steel of the finest, bright and blue, thoroughbrace, bison skin, thick and wide, boot top dasher from tough old hide found in the pit when the tanner died. That was the way he put her through. There, said the deacon, now she'll do. Do, I tell you, I rather guess, she was a wonder and nothing less. Colts grew horses, beards turned gray, deacon and deaconess dropped away. Children and grandchildren, where were they? But there stood the stout old one-hoss shay, as fresh as on Lisbon earthquake day. Eighteen hundred, it came and found the deacon's masterpiece strong and sound. Eighteen hundred increased by ten. Handsome carriage, they called it then. Eighteen hundred and twenty came, running as usual, much the same. Thirty and forty at last arrive, and then come fifty, and fifty-five. Little of all we value here awakes on the morn of its hundredth year without both feeling and looking queer. In fact, there's nothing that keeps its youth, so far as I know, but a tree and truth. This is a moral that runs at large. Take it. You're welcome. No extra charge. First of November, the earthquake day. There are traces of age in the one hoss shay, a general flavor of mild decay, but nothing local, as one may say. There couldn't be, for the deacon's art had made it so like in every part that there wasn't a chance for one to start. For the wheels were just as strong as the thills, and the floor was just as strong as the sills, and the panels just as strong as the floor, and the whipple tree neither less nor more, and the back crossbar as strong as the fore, and spring and axle and hub encore. And yet, as a whole, it is past a doubt, and another hour it will be worn out. First of November, fifty-five. This morning the parson takes a drive. Now, small boys, get out of the way. Here comes the wonderful one hoss shay, drawn by a rat-tailed eunecked bay. Let up, said the parson. Off went they. The parson was working his Sunday's text, had got to fifthly, and stopped perplexed at what the Moses was coming next. All at once the horse stood still, close by the meeting house on the hill. First a shiver, and then a thrill, then something decidedly like a spill, and the parson was sitting upon a rock at half-past nine by the meeting house clock, just the hour of the earthquake shock. What do you think the parson found when he got up and stared around? The poor old chase in a heap or mound, as if it had been to the mill and ground. You see, of course, if you're not a dunce, how it went to pieces all at once. All at once, and nothing first, just as bubbles do when they burst. End of the wonderful one hoss shay. Logic is logic, that's all I say. End of the Deacon's Masterpiece. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. How the Old Horse Won the Bet by Oliver Wendell Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Twas on the famous trotting-ground the betting men were gathered round from far and near, the cracks were there, whose deeds the sporting prince declare, the swift G.M., old Hiram's nag, the fleet S.H., Dan Pfeiffer's brag, with these a third, and who is he that stands beside his fast B.G.? Bud Doble, whose catarrhal name so fills the nasal trump of fame." There, too, stood many a noted steed of messenger and Morgan breed. Green horses also, not a few, unknown as yet what they could do. And all the hacks that know so well the scourgings of the Sunday swell. 
Blue are the skies of opening day, the bordering turf is green with May, the sunshine's golden gleam is thrown on sorrel, chestnut, bay, and roan. The horses paw and prance and neigh, fillies and colts like kittens play, and dance and toss their rippled manes, shining and soft as silken skeins. Wagons and gigs are ranged about, and fashion flaunts her gay turn out. Here stands, each youthful Jehu's dream, the jointed tandem ticklish team. And there in ampler breadth expand the splendors of the foreign hand. On faultless ties and glossy tiles, the lovely bonnets beam their smiles. The style's the man, so books avow. The style's the woman, anyhow. From flounces frothed with creamy lace, peeps out the pug-dog's smutty face. Or spaniel rolls his liquid eye, or stares the wiry pet of sky. O oh, woman, in your hours of ease, so shy with us, so free with these. Come on, I'll bet you two to one, I'll make him do it. Will you? Done. What was it who was bound to do? I did not hear, and can't tell you. Pray listen till my story's through. Scarce noticed, back behind the rest, by cart and wagon rudely pressed, the parson's lean and bony bay stood harnessed in his one-horse shay, lent to his sexton for the day. A funeral, so the sexton said, his mother's uncle's wife was dead. Like Lazarus bid to Dives's feast, so looked the poor forlorn old beast. His coat was rough, his tail was bare, the gray was sprinkled in his hair. Sportsmen and jockeys knew him not, and yet they say he once could trot among the fleetest of the town, till something cracked and broke him down. The steed's the statesman's common lot. And are we then so soon forgot? Ah, me, I doubt if one of you has ever heard the name Old Blue, whose fame through all this region rung in those old days when I was young. Bring forth the horse. Alas, he showed not like the one Mazeppa rode, scant-maned, sharp-backed, and shaky-kneed, the wreck of what was once a steed. Lips thin, eyes hollow, stiff in joints, yet not without his knowing points. The sexton, laughing in his sleeve, as if t'were all a make-believe, led forth the horse, and as he laughed, unhitched the breeching from a shaft, unclasped the rusty belt beneath, drew forth the snaffle from his teeth, slipped off his headstall, set him free from strap and rein, a sight to see. So worn, so lean in every limb, it can't be they are saddling him. It is his back the pigskin strides and flaps his lank rheumatic sides. With look of mingled scorn and mirth, they buckle round the saddle girth. With horsey wink and saucy toss, a youngster throws his leg across. And so, his rider on his back, they lead him limping to the track, far up behind the starting point, to limber out each stiffened joint. As through the jeering crowd he passed, one pitying look old Hiram cast. "'Go it, ye cripple, why ye can!' cried out unsentimental Dan. "'A fast day dinner for the crows!' Bud Doble's scoffing shout arose. Slowly, as when the walking beam first feels the gathering head of steam, with warning cough and threatening wheeze, the stiff old charger crooks his knees, at first with cautious step sedate, as if he dragged a coach of state. He's not a colt. He knows full well that time is weight, and sure to tell. No horse so sturdy but he fears the handicap of twenty years. As through the throng on either hand the old horse nears the judge's stand, beneath his jockey's featherweight, he warms a little to his gait. And now and then a step is tried that hints of something like a stride. Go! Through his ear the summons stung as if a battle trump had rung. The slumbering instincts long unstirred start at the old familiar word. It thrills like flame through every limb. What mean his twenty years to him? The savage blow his rider dealt fell on his hollow flanks unfelt. The spur that pricked his staring hide unheeded tore his bleeding side. Alike to him are spur and rein, he steps a five-year-old again. Before the quarter-pole was passed, old Hiram said, He's going fast. Long ere the quarter was a half, the chuckling crowd had ceased to laugh. Tighter his frightened jockey clung, as in a mighty stride he swung, the gravel flying in his track, his neck stretched out, his ears laid back, his tail extended all the while, behind him like a rat-tail file. Off went a shoe, away it spun, shot like a bullet from a gun. The quaking jockey shapes a prayer, from scraps of oaths he used to swear. He drops his whip, he drops his rein, 
He clutches fiercely for a mane. He'll lose his hold. He sways and reels. He'll slide beneath those trampling heels. The knees of many a horseman quake. The flowers on many a bonnet shake. And shouts arise from left and right. Stick on, stick on, hold tight, hold tight. Cling round his neck and don't let go. That pace can't hold. There, steady, whoa! But like the sable steed that bore the spectral lover of Lenore, his nostrils snorting foam and fire, no stretch his bony limbs can tire. And now the stand he rushes by, and stop him, stop him, is the cry. Stand back, he's only just begun. He's having out three heats in one. Don't rush in front, he'll smash your brains, but follow up and grab the reins. Old Hiram spoke, Dan Pfeiffer heard, and sprang impatient at the word. Bud Doble started on his bay, old Hiram followed on his gray, and off they spring and round they go, the fast ones doing all they know. Look, twice they follow at his heels, as round the circling course he wheels, and whirls with him that clinging boy like Hector round the walls of Troy. Still on and on the third time round, they're tailing off, they're losing ground. Bud Doble's nag begins to fail, Dan Pfeiffer's sorrel whisks his tail. And see, in spite of whip and shout, old Hiram's mare is giving out. Now for the finish, at the turn, the old horse, all the rest astern, comes swinging in with easy trot. By Jove, he's distanced all the lot. That trot no mortal could explain. Some said, Old Dutchman, come again. Some took his time, at least they tried, but what it was could none decide. One said he couldn't understand what happened to his second hand. One said two ten. That couldn't be, more like two twenty, two or three. Old Hiram settled it at last. The time was too, too devilish fast. The parson's horse had won the bet. It cost him something of a sweat. Back in the one-hoss shay he went. The parson wondered what it meant, and murmured with a mild surprise and pleasant twinkle of the eyes, That funeral must have been a trick, or corpses drive at double quick. I shouldn't wonder, I declare, if Brother Jehu made the prayer. And this is all I have to say about that tough old trotting bay. Hut up, hut up, galong, good day. Moral for which this tale is told, a horse can trot for all he's old. End of How the Old Horse Won the Bet Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden The Broomstick Train, or The Return of the Witches, by Oliver Wendell Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Look out! Look out, boys! Clear the track! The witches are here! They've all come back! They hang them high! No use! No use! What cares a witch for a hangman's noose? They buried them deep, but they wouldn't lie still, for cats and witches are hard to kill. They swore they shouldn't and wouldn't die. Books said they did, but they lie. They lie. A couple of hundred years or so they had knocked about in the world below, when an Essex deacon dropped in to call, and a homesick feeling seized them all, for he came from a place they knew full well, and many a tale he had to tell. They longed to visit the haunts of men, to see the old dwellings they knew again and ride on their broomsticks all around their wide domain of unhallowed ground. In Essex County there's many a roof, well known to him of the cloven hoof. The small square windows are full in view, which the midnight hags went sailing through, on their well-trained broomsticks mounted high, seen like shadows against the sky, crossing the track of owls and bats, hugging before them their coal-black cats. Well did they know, those gray old wives, the sights we see in our daily drives. Shimmer of lake and shine of sea, Brown's bare hill with its lonely tree. It wasn't then as we see it now, with one scant scalp-lock to shade its brow. Dusky nooks in the Essex woods, dark dim Dante-like solitudes, where the tree-toed watches the sinuous snake, glide through his forests of fern and brake. Ipswich River, its old stone bridge, far off Andover's Indian Ridge, and many a scene where history tells some shadow of bygone terror dwells, of Norman's woe with its tale of dread, of the screeching woman of Marblehead, the fearful story that turns men pale. Don't bid me tell it, my speech would fail. 
who would not will not if he can bathe in the breezes of fair cape ann rest in the bowers her bays enfold loved by the sachems and squaws of old home where the white magnolias bloom sweet with the bayberry's chaste perfume hugged by the woods and kissed by the sea where is the eden like to thee for that couple of hundred years or so there had been no peace in the world below the witches still grumbling it isn't fair come give us a taste of the upper air we've had enough of your sulphur springs and the evil odor that round them clings we long for a drink that is cool and nice great buckets of water with winnum ice we've served you well upstairs you know you're a good old fellow come let us go i don't feel sure of his being good but he happened to be in a pleasant mood as fiends with their skins full sometimes are he'd been drinking with roughs at a boston bar so what does he do but up and shout to a gray-beard turnkey let him out to mind his orders was all he knew the gate swung open and out they flew where are our broomsticks the beldams cried here are your broomsticks an imp replied they've been in the place you know so long they smell of brimstone uncommon strong but they've gained by being left alone just look and you'll see how tall they've grown and where is my cat a vixen squalled yes where are our cats the witches bawled and began to call them all by name and as fast as they called the cats they came there was bobtailed tommy and long-tailed tim and wall-eyed jackie and green-eyed jim and splayfoot benny and slim-legged beau and skinny and squally and jerry and joe and many another that came at call it would take too long to count them all all black one could hardly tell which was which but every cat knew his own old witch and she knew hers as hers knew her ah didn't they curl their tails and purr no sooner the withered hags were free than out they swarmed for a midnight spree i couldn't tell all they did in rhymes but the essex people had dreadful times the swampscott fishermen still relate how a strange sea monster stole their bait how their nets were tangled in loops and knots and they found dead crabs in their lobster pots poor danvers grieved for her blasted crops and wilmington mourned over mildewed hops a blight played havoc with beverly beans it was all the work of those hateful queens a dreadful panic began at Pride's, where the witches stopped in their midnight rides, and there rose strange rumors and vague alarms mid the peaceful dwellers at Beverly Farms. Now when the boss of the Beldams found that without his leave they were ramping round, he called, they could hear him twenty miles, from Chelsea Beach to the Misery Isles. The deafest old granny knew his tone without the trick of the telephone. "'Come here, you witches, come here,' says he. At your games of old, without asking me? I'll give you a little job to do that will keep you stirring, you godless crew. They came, of course, at their master's call, the witches, the broomsticks, the cats, and all. He led the hags to a railway train the horses were trying to drag in vain. Now then, says he, you've had your fun, and here are the cars you've got to run. The driver may just unhitch his team. We don't want horses. We don't want steam. You may keep your old black cats to hug, but the loaded train you've got to lug. Since then on many a car you'll see a broomstick plain as plain can be. On every stick there's a witch astride. The string, you see, to her leg is tied. She will do a mischief if she can, but the string is held by a careful man, and whenever the evil-minded witch would cut some caper, he gives a twitch. As for the hag, you can't see her, but hark, you can hear her black cat's purr and now and then as a car goes by you may catch a gleam from her wicked eye often you've looked on a rushing train but just what moved it was not so plain it couldn't be those wires above for they could neither pull nor shove where was the motor that made it go you couldn't guess but now you know remember my rhymes when you ride again on the rattling rail by the broomstick train end of the broomstick train recorded by laurie ann walden